Hello, hi there, I'm Doug Picklick, editor of HPAC Magazine, and this is 30 Mechanical Minutes, virtual content for real-time professionals. Today, I'm having a conversation with a true expert in the hydronics field, and someone I'm proud to say has been a regular contributor to HPAC Magazine uh, for a very long time, Mr. John Siegenthaler. Hi, John. Hi, Doug, good to be with you. Thank you for being here. Just going to share this with everyone. We're here today to talk about expansion tanks, um, an extremely necessary element in um, any hydronic system design. Uh, as I think we all know, expansion tanks help keep the pressure under control in your closed loop hydronic system. Sure, your system has a pressure release valve, but John, unless I'm mistaken, that valve is a last resort and you don't want that valve to come into play ever. Uh, ideally, you don't. It, it, as you say, it is a last resort. Uh, the expansion tank should do uh, the majority of the work handling the expansion and contraction of the fluid. Okay. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsor for today's session, and that's Wolseley Canada, the national wholesaler serving the mechanical industry with over 220 branches from coast to coast. Thank you, Wolseley Canada, for your support. All right, John, we're talking today about expansion tanks. Uh, we see them in every hydronic system installation, slightly different shapes and sizes. So to start, can you tell us how do you best commission the expansion tank when setting up your system? Sure, and if we jump over to the next slide, Doug, uh, we've got a graphic that shows that. Um, modern hydronic systems are going to use typically a diaphragm type expansion tank. Um, older systems would use standard tanks and so forth, but what we're talking about today is, is a diaphragm type tank. And on the left side there, you'll see, uh, basically within a steel shell of the tank, you have a flexible rubber diaphragm that can move up and down. Water presses into the top part of the tank as it heats up in the system and expands, and that compresses against the air that is captive down in the bottom part of the tank. Way down at the very bottom, you've got an air valve, which looks just like the valve on, on a tire. And you can control the pressure uh, in that tank when you commission the tank using that air valve. And I'll, I'll touch on that in just a minute. Now, as the water in the system cools and contracts, you can see that the diaphragm moves up. That's the middle image there. So that cooler water is moving back into the system. So an expansion tank acts like, like a cushion, and some people even call them you know, cushion tanks and systems. Uh, but over on the far right, that picture shows what the diaphragm should look like when you commission a tank. And, and by that, I mean, uh, the system has not yet been filled with water. Uh, there's a relatively simple calculation you can make to determine what the static pressure of the water is uh, or will be when you put water in the system, but before it's heated. And it's based on the height of the system. And what you want to do is adjust the pressure in the air side so that it's equal to the static pressure on the water side of the tank. If you do that, and you, again, you do this before you put water in the system, the diaphragm is fully expanded against the upper shell of the tank. And the reason we do this is to maximize the amount of acceptance volume that the tank has. If, if we don't adjust that pressure, uh, for example, let's say the tank comes shipped with 12 PSI of air pressure, but the static pressure in your system is, is 20 PSI because maybe it's a three-story or four-story high system. What's going to happen is when you put water in that system, that diaphragm is going to partially uh, lower itself, sort of like the middle image there. And what that does is it reduces the available volume in the expansion tank once the water starts to heat. So the optimal way to set up or commission that tank is to calculate what the static pressure is at that location where the tank taps into the system and then adjust the air pressure. And you can use a standard uh, tire pump, compressor, even a bicycle pump 
to increase the pressure if you need to, or uh, perhaps you want to decrease the pressure, just press in on the stem. But that, that is a, a, an important part of commissioning an expansion tank properly. Okay. Now, I know that this, when it comes to sizing a tank, there's, there's calculations for that. I know it's probably in your uh, modern hydronics textbook, um, but people can find that calculation. Yes. Yeah, there are, there are calculations uh, today, you know, a variety of manufacturers, they have online tools to size up the expansion tanks as well. But yeah, we actually have a whole chapter in the textbook devoted to expansion tanks, a part of which is sizing the tank. Okay, awesome. Now, I've seen uh, probably hundreds of photos of different hydronic system installations. And uh, the positioning of the expansion tank seems to vary a, a, a quite a bit. Um, I was, I'm just wondering, is there an optimal placement for the expansion tank, like on the supply line, return line? Or I think you've talked about this before, about being before or after a hydraulic separator. Just where is the best spot? Sure. Well, let's jump to the next slide and we'll show it. Okay. Uh, the important thing to remember about a closed hydronic loop with an expansion tank is wherever the tank is attached to that circuit becomes what we call the point of no pressure change. And what that means is that if we have a certain pressure there, and you can see it in this diagram, it shows 10 PSI where the tank is actually tied to that little red line up there. And when we turn the circulator on, that pressure will not go up and it will not go down. So that's why we call it the point of no pressure change. Now, if you look at the green dash line, you see it and going around this circuit. Um, for simplicity, let's just assume the circuit is horizontal piping, so we don't have any change in static pressure due to elevation. But the green line shows what's going to happen to pressure when we turn the circulator on. And you'll see at every location other than the point of no pressure change, that pressure either goes down slightly or it goes up. And ideally, we want it to go up. We want to stay away from conditions that could potentially cause air to get sucked into the circuit through an air vent uh, or conditions that could potentially cause cavitation in the circulator. Now, in this particular diagram, it shows the pressure decreasing by, well, from 10 PSI at the expansion tank, a point of no pressure change, down to nine PSI at the inlet of the circulator. And then, of course, as the flow goes through the circulator, the pressure increases. In this case, it goes up to 18 PSI. And then if you just trace that green line, just trace it around, you'll see as we go around the circuit, because we have friction, we're losing pressure. That drop in pressure is the evidence of friction between the fluid and the, and the piping system. And eventually, we come all the way back around right to that point of no pressure change at 10 PSI. So the key concept to make it work like this, and this is the, the correct way to do it, is that the expansion tank should be close to the inlet of the circulator, okay? It doesn't have to be like an inch or two away. It could be maybe a foot away, but we don't wanna have any significant pressure drop between where we tap the expansion tank into the loop and the inlet of the circulator. So, um, Oftentimes this concept is referred to as pumping away. And pumping away doesn't mean pumping away from the boiler. It means pumping away from the point where the expansion tank is tapped into the system. Okay. Right. Now I wanna show you what happens when we move the tank to the other side of the circulator. So we'll jump to the next slide. So it's the same circuit and what happens now, because we're pumping towards the expansion tank, you'll see the point of no pressure change, just it always moves with the expansion tank. And now if we trace around that green line, initially we're at positive pressure here, we're at four PSI. And then as we go back around two PSI, but look at what happens at the next corner. We're down to zero PSI. That means in theory, the pressure of the water in the pipe is the same as atmospheric pressure. And then from that point back, we're actually at negative pressure. Now, when we have negative pressure in a piping circuit, if there's an air vent, for example, or even a loose valve packing, uh, air can actually get sucked in 
air vents are classic, especially float type air vents. They're a classic um, air emitter, I'll call them, when we have negative pressure in the system. So uh, this is often what is the underlying cause of chronic air problems in a circuit. If you have a, a project and somebody says, well, we had air in a pipe, we flushed it out, and then a week later or even the next day, the air is back. What's happening? You know, why is the air always coming back into the system? And typically the answer is it's getting sucked in at some location where the pressure is going subatmospheric and there's some component that allows that air to come into the system. So this is the incorrect way to do it. We don't want to pump towards the expansion tank. We want to pump away from the expansion tank. Okay. And again, this is horizontal. This is just a demonstration, but it does give us an indication of what would happen. Right. Uh, if we go to loops, uh, circuits that have vertical displacements, the pressures will change a bit just due to changes in elevation. But the concept of decreasing pressure as we go around the circuit and pumping away, that, that doesn't change regardless of the the vertical displacement or the horizontal displacement of the loop. We always want to pump away from that expansion tank. Good to know. And I know I had mentioned the, um, the hydraulic separator. You mm -hmm. have something to say about that. <laughs> sure. You know, uh, today hydraulic separators are becoming more and more common. Uh, typical setup is we, we have the heat source on one side of the separator with a circulator. And then we have our load circuits over on the other side. And the question sometimes comes up, where do I put the expansion tank when I have a system with a hydraulic separator? And the answer is you can put it on either side of the separator. I'd like to put it on the cool line because it minimizes heating the tank shell. And that, that's a small detail, but whenever you uh, heat the tank shell, just due to conduction from the, the heat that's in the system, uh, that also decreases the ability of the expansion tank. Uh, and ultimately, it could cause the relief valve to open, if the, especially if the expansion tank was undersized. So you want to keep the expansion tank as cool as practical. The thing you do not want to do when you have a hydraulic separator is tap the expansion tank into the bottom drain connection on the separator. And uh -huh. the reason for that is, these separators will separate dirt in the system from the system fluid, and that dirt's going to collect in the bottom of the separator. And if the expansion tank is, is piped in at that location, the dirt's simply going to settle down on top of the diaphragm in the tank, and, and it will inevitably affect that tank. I, I won't say it'll cause it to fail immediately, but it's not a condition we want to allow. So just like the diagram show here, you can put it on either side of the hydraulic separator um, because the pressure drop through the separator is, is very, very low. So really there's no advantage. It's more a matter of convenience uh, which side of the separator you put it on. Okay. And of course, before, in front of the circulator. There Correct. we are. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Well, you, you know, you mentioned this, but do tanks fail or get weaker with age? Like, do you need to monitor the health of an expansion tank? Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult to do that, but to answer your question, uh, some tanks do fail. And quite honestly, Doug, I've seen tanks go 30 years, no problem. I've seen tanks fail in two years, and I, I'm not really sure why that occurs. Oh. Uh, but Typically, to test whether your tank is still good or not, if you go to the air valve at the bottom of the tank, right. unscrew that little plastic cap, and then just take a nail or you know some little pin and press in on the stem of that, if water comes spraying out, the tank is shot. The, and the reason I say that is because, remember, the bottom of the tank, where that air valve is, that is the air, the captive air volume in the tank. If the diaphragm has cracked or failed, inevitably what will happen is the feed, the makeup water system will feed fluid into it as, you know, as the air vents rid air out of the system. And we get what's called a waterlogged tank. Basically the tank will be full of water. Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, you can, you can usually take your, your knuckles and you can tap on the tank. And if you have a hollow sound on the bottom of the tank, that's good. 
Yeah. If you tap your knuckles on the tank and you get a thud, you know, just imagine a, a three gallon steel tank that's full of water. It's, you know, it's a fairly significant mass. If you tap and it's a thud, uh, that may not, that may indicate you've got a failed diaphragm. And as I say, the real test, push, press in on the air valve at the bottom. And uh, if you have water spraying out of there, uh, the tank's got to be replaced. And if you look in these schematics, you'll see there's a ball valve right above the tank. And I, I take the handle off that ball valve and I, I put it somewhere. So, you know, I don't throw it away, but the reason I take the handle off is that valve is only there if you have to remove the tank. It's a matter of simply uh, minimizing the amount of fluid in the system that is going to come out when you take the tank off. And it's not a valve that should be, you know, that somebody that doesn't really know what they're doing, you don't want them shutting that valve off because if they do, they isolate the tank from the system. And what's going to happen is you're going to have uh, the, the pressure relief valve is, is basically going to open every time the system heats up and, and spill some water. And, and by the way, that phenomena, if you see the relief valve dribbling water consistently when the system heats up, it's probably due to a failed expansion tank. Uh -huh. So that's kind of a, a symptom. And uh, when you see that, go check out the tank. And uh, as I say, if, it, if there's water coming out the bottom, you've got to change the tank. Well, okay. I've also seen installations where the installer places a gauge leading into the tank. I mean, is that a recommendation? Or? Uh, sure. It's, it's nice to have that. It would tell you what the, basically what the cold fill or what the pressure is at that location. Um, I won't call it an essential component. Uh, it is also a component that some pressure reducing valves uh, actually have built into them at this point. Uh, it's a nice piece of trim on a system. Uh, it's not critical, but it's, you know, it's nice okay. to have that. Now, also, uh, I've seen tanks suspended in midair, like hanging kind of precariously uh, from, from some systems, like a simple nudge could break it off. So I know you have some suggestions with respect to, to securing these things. We do. Yeah, jump over to the next slide. Um, one of the things that's very easy to do with these small expansion tanks is if you bump into them, uh, you're going to bend that connection at the top. That The steel shell on this tank is relatively thin and it will bend right where the, the threaded uh, connection port of the tank is welded into the steel shell. And uh, I mean, you can bend it and uh, you know, you, if you're lucky, you might be able to bend it back, but you might get away with that once. Uh, but if it gets bumped repeatedly, it's, it's eventually going to just break that connection. So over on the far left, uh, what this installer did, he actually, uh, you're looking at a corner in a basement wall, a uh, concrete wall there. Instead of just running the pipe around a 90, he put a couple 45s in and he actually brought that air separator out, maybe about a foot away from the wall. And then the tank hangs from that. And that tank is fine hanging from that connection like that. It is in this particular um, installation, it's behind the boilers. It's not in an area where it's going to get bumped into. So from a weight standpoint, there, there's no problem in, in putting the tank in like this. Uh, the middle picture shows a system that was uh, installed out west. And there was actually seismic codes that require any tank in a system to have a seismic constraint. And you can see there's a, a seismic bracket there. It's probably a bracket that was originally designed to hold a uh, domestic water heater, but it's been adapted to that. And then over on the far right, this is a tank and a geothermal heat pump system, which we're gonna talk about shortly. And you'll see up in that area where Doug's moving the cursor, there's a couple threaded rods that go to clamps on the pipe. So that holds it uh, both vertically and holds it horizontally. But to give it extra stiffness down at the bottom, there's what's called a hydro claw. And this is a, just a, a contractor uh, came up with this idea and markets this. It's basically just a, a steel strap that has some cushioning material on it. And that fastens back to the wooden block there on the wall. That's just so the tank is, is plumb. And then uh, when you tighten a couple bolts down, that gives a, a really good cradling effect to that tank. So 
So that tank is well supported, both from a weight standpoint and also if somebody does happen to bump into it or somebody stacks boxes up or whatever happens, uh, mechanically that tank is, is in good shape. I, I do want to mention one other point while we're looking at these slides, Doug. Uh, sometimes you'll walk into a project and you'll see the tank mounted with the water connection on the bottom. These tanks are all hanging vertically with the water on the top. Generally speaking, it's not a good idea to mount the tank either horizontally or with the, I'll say with the air valve up at the top. And the reason for that is that air will actually get trapped on the water side of the tank. Now, eventually that air will probably be displaced by water, but um, you wanna remember also that the inside of these tanks is just carbon steel. These are not stainless steel, they're not coated tanks. And with the uh, tank inverted like that, there's a better chance that you may get some corrosion failure. And, and also it's quite vulnerable uh, from a mechanical you know, bumping standpoint. It's, it's actually better to have the tank as it's shown here, as opposed to um, upside down. And horizontal, we've seen systems with the tank horizontal. That puts a lot of strain on that connection unless the tank is really well supported. Yeah. So the ideal way to mount these tanks is as we're showing them here with uh, the water connection up at the top. Okay, very good. You know, I was also uh, mm -hmm. wondering, I, as we move towards uh, kind of lower temperature hydronic heating distribution, mm -hmm. does that affect the expansion tank setup in any way? It does. It does. Um, you know, the classic method of sizing expansion tanks would look at the entire volume of water in the system going to some high temperature. And, you know, before the days of, of uh, heat pumps and modulating condensing boilers, boilers would often run up around 160, maybe even 180 degrees Fahrenheit. So the classic sizing method would be to assume that the entire water volume in the system goes from some cold temperature, let's say 55 or 60 degrees Fahrenheit, all the way up to some maximum temperature. And you know that assumption is it's conservative. It's actually going to, in theory, overestimate the, the size of the tank. And what happens in reality is all the water doesn't go up to that high temperature. Now, imagine a, a large commercial radiant system uh, it could easily have three or 400 gallons of water in it if you've got several thousand feet of maybe five eighths or three quarter inch PEX tubing out there in a the slab. That water, even if the boiler went up to 160 and there was a mixing system of some sort, the water in the slab may never go above, you know, whatever 110 degrees, 115 degrees Fahrenheit. So there are methods, and we do talk about them in the textbook, where you can compensate for the fact that some of the water in the system goes through a, a larger temperature change than the other portion of the water. And what it does, it'll actually reduce the required size of the tank. And I, I will use that on a big project because, you know, if you we've had projects with 23,000 feet of three quarter inch PEX tubing, and we're looking at large floor mounted expansion tanks, um, you know, they, they can get quite large and quite expensive. And you know, when we've got 23,000 feet of three quarter inch packs in a floor heating system, that water is not all going up anywhere as close to 160, 180 degrees. It's probably only going to maybe 105. So these other methods of sizing can account for that and they will save costs because they correctly size the tank for the actual amount of fluid expansion that's going to occur. Right. Okay, we had also, um, you had mentioned uh, the geothermal earth loop and mm -hmm. just do you need an expansion tank um, with the geothermal, geothermal earth loop? Sure, well, let's jump over. I think that's our, our slides here. Um, to answer your question, Doug, yes, you do. Oh. And, and the reason I put the slide in here is that over the years as geothermal systems have been developed starting way back in the, oh, early 80s. Um, one of the schools of thought was that the high density polyethylene pipe that is being used for the earth loop uh, will have enough elasticity that you don't need an expansion tank. And there were hundreds, maybe thousands of systems installed 
that did not have an expansion tank. And some of them worked and some of them really had some, some problems. And what happens, and we did a fairly detailed uh, analysis of these situations. And what we found is that the, the, the rate that the pipe expands, it, its internal volume, we call that volumetric expansion. The rate of volumetric expansion of the pipe is different from the rate of volumetric expansion of the fluid. Okay, so what happens in the winter is that the pipe actually, the internal volume of the pipe actually shrinks at a higher rate than the fluid shrinks. And what that will do is it'll push the pressure up in the earth loop in winter when that loop is being cooled. Uh, and if the loop goes up to 40 or 50 PSI, in theory, that's not a problem at all. But if you did have any marginal fittings, for example, you, you might get a leak where if the pressure stayed at maybe 10 or 15 PSI, it wouldn't leak. So the other direction, what happens in the summer is tends to be more of a problem. The pipe expands faster than the fluid. And what that does is it causes the pressure in earth loop to drop. And when you don't have an expansion tank, the pressure can drop to the point where the circulator will cavitate. And sometimes I've heard that referred to as a, a flat earth loop. And hmm. you know, it's kind of a slang term, but what, what they're actually seeing is that the, the circulator is cavitating because uh, the pressure is low enough that the fluid is actually changing to a vapor right at the eye of the impeller. So by putting an expansion tank in an earth loop, you minimize the pressure variations between winter and summer. Uh, it, it doesn't hold the pressure exactly the same, but it, it reduces the swing to the point where it's of no concern. So I am a firm believer in putting an expansion tank in any kind of a closed earth loop system. If you look at any schematics coming out of the European hydronics market, every geothermal earth loop would have an expansion tank in it. And, and of course, remember that that's just for the earth loop. The right. remainder of the system on the other side of the heat pump needs another expansion tank. Right. So any, anywhere you have a heat exchanger and you've got two circuits, you need an expansion tank, tank on either side of those closed loop circuits. Is that right? That's correct. When you have two closed loop circuits and you have anything that isolates them from each other, you know, the heat pump would be one example. A heat exchanger in a snow melt system would be another example. Uh, when you have two isolated closed loop circuits, you should have an expansion tank in both circuits as well as a pressure relief valve. Because again, those circuits cannot communicate in terms of pressure or expansion or contraction of fluid. Uh, they're two independent volumes of fluid. And as such, an expansion tank on each side is a good idea. Okay, John, we're going to jump to our questions and answers here. Okay. We have a few. Uh, Scott asked about a calculation for system static pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, I can I can recite it to you, but it's it's easier to see it in, as in a formula. But basically, take the distance from where the expansion tank tees into your pipe, all the way to the top of the system, in feet. So let's say the expansion tank is at elevation zero and the top of the system's at 20 feet above that. Multiply that height by 0.43. That will give you the static pressure due to the weight of the fluid. And then what I like to do, I add five PSI to that. And the reason I add five PSI, we still wanna have some positive pressure at the top of the system. Okay, so basically it's the distance from where the tank taps into the piping to the top of the system measured in feet, you multiply that by 0.43 and then add five to it. And that'll give you the static pressure at the location of the expansion tank. And that's, that's the pressure that you wanna adjust that air, uh, air valve to. Right. Okay, Robin asked, can the tank be installed in any orientation? And then the next person actually asked, can the tank be installed with the air side up top? You've answered that question. Um, yeah. And the answer? The answer is it's not preferred. Uh, uh -huh. The tank will work. Uh, most of the manufacturers don't really like to see it like that. 
it's more vulnerable to damage like that. So I won't say it's an absolute failure. I mean, I have seen systems with vertical tanks that, that will work, but the preferred location or the preferred orientation of the tank would be with the water side up as, as we've shown it in these schematics. Right. Uh, Grant says designers of large systems often add a makeup water line with a pressure regulator pressurizing the loop to somewhere around 12 PSI. Is there a best place on the circuit to connect this makeup? Does the makeup pressure affect the expansion tank? Uh, yeah, actually the, the slide we're looking at right now, those components to the above and to the left of the tank, that is the makeup water. So you've, yeah, you've got a, a, um, a backflow preventer, then you've got the pressure reducing valve to the right of it. Uh, the ball valve that's above, yep, that valve right there, that's just for fast filling. If you want to get water into the system quickly, you can put a ball valve there. And that's, that's helpful when you're purging. But um, yeah, the expansion tank can be literally right there as part of that makeup water assembly. I, I often will draw it like that. Um, now, I, I, having said that, it's, it's not critical that you make it look like this. You can tie the expansion tank into the bottom of an air separator, okay? Uh, just make sure that the location of that air separator is upstream of circulators. Remember, you want the, the point where the tank connects to the system, you want that to be on the inlet side of the circulators. Um, and then if you are adjusting, um, well, let, let's put it this way. Most of the tank manufacturers will state a, that they pre-charge the tanks to 12 PSI. That's, that's very adequate for most residential like commercial buildings, uh, but it's not a guarantee. When you get the tank, you wanna put a zero to 30 PSI gauge, a low pressure tire gauge, for example, on that air valve and check what that pressure is. If you've got a tall system in a, you know, a multi-story building, uh, you're going to want to have a makeup system that's adjusted to high enough pressure so that it can press water all the way to the top of that system. And correspondingly, you want to adjust the air side pressure in the expansion tank to match that, whatever that static pressure is. So to answer Grant's question, yes, the, the uh, makeup water assembly can be right next to the tank like this. And uh, the height of the system is really what determines the static pressure. And that would determine how you would set your pressure uh, reducing valve and also uh, how much air pressure you wanna put in the air side of the tank before you fill the system. Okay. Robin asks here, traditionally the tank is installed off the bottom of the micro bubble resorber. Mm -hmm. Is this still recommended for magnetic air and dirt separators? Well, uh, you probably won't do it with any magnetic dirt separator because the bottom of that separator is going to have the dirt valve, you know, where you flush the dirt out. But uh, any of the microbubble air separators on the market, just about all of them do have a half inch threaded port on the bottom. And you can thread the tank into that location. There's nothing wrong with that. Again, I, I go back to where is the circulator located? There's nothing wrong with, with threading the tank into the bottom of the micro bubble air separator, provided that that air separator is upstream and relatively close to the inlet of the circulator. We have a question. Uh, so someone has asked about uh, how do you size an expansion tank? I think we talked about that early. You su suggested all the manufacturers, there's, there's software on... Sure. Online, you can yeah, find there's on, online software. Um, I mean, I, I do cover, you know, the, kind of the theory of it and, and what, what the equations are and some examples of how to do it. But uh, many of the manufacturers have either tables or they have online software. You're going to need to know the system volume or at least an estimate of the system volume. So, for example, one of the things you're, you want to have is how many... Um, what fraction of a gallon per foot does uh, all the different pipe sizes in your system contain? If your system has two inch pipe in it and maybe some half inch packs, you know, you can look that information up, gallons per foot. 
and make an estimate of how much water is in the system. And you're also going to uh, need to know what is the temperature change of that water from, from what we call the cold fill condition, where you're just taking regular cold water out of your tap and putting it in the system up to the maximum water temperature the system's going to operate at. Because that, that determines how much expansion volume you're going to have. So as you would expect, large commercial systems have much larger expansion tank requirements compared to residential systems. And in all honesty, of residential systems, the tanks are often just, you know, I used a, you know, a, a, a Model 30 tank on this system. Next week, I've got a similar system. Do I need to go through the calculations again? You know, in all honesty, probably not. And, and I know, Doug, when we were talking earlier, you asked about, uh, is there a penalty in oversizing an expansion tank? And, you know, there really isn't other than cost. Uh, you know, the larger the tank, the more it costs. As you put a larger tank in the system, you're going to get less pressure fluctuation. But, uh, you know, obviously it is going to add cost. So I would say err on the side of oversizing the tank rather than undersizing the tank, but don't go crazy. You know, if it needs a three gallon tank by calculation and you put a 20 gallon tank in, it's going to work but you've spent a lot more money than you need to. Okay. We're getting close to our time here. So I'm being sensitive to that. And there's a few questions here that maybe John, we can uh, have you uh, approach offline and, and get back to these people individually. Sure. Um, someone has asked, we, we had mentioned uh, the textbook. How can they get a hold of that textbook? Um, yeah, well, the fourth edition of Modern Hydronic Heating came out this past April. I've uh, been working on it. Well, actually, through the COVID crisis, things got delayed like, like most things did. But it was released in April. It's got about uh, well over 100 more pages. And uh, this time we got into a whole chapter on hydronic cooling. Uh, you can get the textbook through any of the online uh, vendors, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and I'm sure there's several others. Um, it's out there, it's available. And uh, as I said, we've got a whole chapter on expansion tanks that gets into more detail, like to Doug's uh, question about large radiant systems or low temperature systems. How do you, how do you compensate for that? So those, the mathematics and, and the examples and the data that you need uh, to size a tank, they're, they're all in that chapter in the book. Okay, uh, there's a question here from Jeff that I'm gonna, we're gonna take offline. I'm gonna let you uh, uh, get in touch with him on that one. Mm -hmm. um, this is the last one we're gonna ask. It's from Steve. He says, do you, do you use the same static pressure formula for a domestic water heater? Uh, no, no, if you're sizing an expansion tank for a domestic water heater, uh, it's going to be the line pressure that you're working with. Uh, you know, you could have you could have 80 psi cold water pressure in in a house. So uh, you're going to have to um, size the tank uh, based on the static pressure of the domestic water system, not not the static pressure of uh, an isolated uh, closed loop. Okay. And and you know to to that question too, the manufacturers uh, again, I'm sure they have. Uh, the suitable, you know, software and formulas to size those tanks up as well. Those uh, expansion tanks for domestic water systems. Okay, perfect. Um, well, John, I think we're going to close down. We try to keep it to thirty minutes. We've gone a little over today. I hope everyone's okay with that. So, John, thank you again for participating in today's thirty mechanical minutes. And again, I'd like to thank our sponsor for this episode of 30 Mechanical Minutes, and that's Wolseley Canada. Check out wolseleyexpress.com. And of course, thank you to everyone who joined us on the webinar today. A recording of this session will be available on our website, hpacmag.com, in the days ahead. And there will be a, a, a link sent out to everyone who registered for this event today. Um, uh, uh, I should let you know that the sessions will also be available on our website, hpacmag.com in the days ahead. 
Uh, you'll be, you can also see past episodes of 30 Mechanical Minutes under our Tech Pulse section on the website and on our YouTube channel. So you can subscribe to that and never miss another episode of 30 Mechanical Minutes. All right, until next time, thank you everyone. Thanks, Doug.